How do you tune and optimize the new Intel Core Ultra 200S CPUs to extract max performance? In this video, we are going to find out. My name is Matt, I'm a former rocket scientist, and my goal is to help you make the right component choices and put them together the right way every single time. In the It's Not Rocket Science series, we've been helping you troubleshoot and optimize your system to keep your PC running like a pro. It's Not Rocket Science, and as you'll see throughout this series, it really is Lego. In this video, our focus will be on how to properly tune an Intel Core Ultra 200S CPU, something every Intel PC gamer and enthusiast should know how to do. As with my previous optimization guides, I'll walk you through how to do this the easy way. No complicated hardcore overclocking in BIOS is required. And don't worry, these tweaks will not only increase performance, but will also help significantly reduce system latency, an issue that has plagued these processes since launch. So stay tuned as I guide you through how to tweak your Intel Core Ultra 200S processor the right way. So the question that I'm sure many of you are asking is, how do you unlock this performance? As with my previous video on the 260 5K, there are a few important BIOS tweaks that you will need to make in order to unlock the true potential of the Intel Core Ultra 9 285K. The first is to install a kit of high-speed RAM and turn XMP on. As I explained earlier in the video, the memory controller for Arrow Lake is exceptionally good. For my MSI Meg Z890 Unify X motherboard, which is a 2DIM board that is specifically designed for enhanced memory overclocking, I was able to use a kit of DDR5 9000 QDIM RAM in Gear 2. However, the motherboard that I use to test the 265K, the Gigabyte Z890 Aorus Master, is a 4DIM motherboard that wouldn't boot with memory speeds above 8800. So I wouldn't recommend anything above 8800 mega transfers per second for 4DIM Z890 motherboards. Since turning on XMP overclocks your memory, there is no guarantee that these speeds will be stable, even with a QDIM kit, so I strongly encourage you to run a memory stability tool like Kahu to check. If your system is unstable, you can try increasing the DRAM VDD and VDDQ voltages by small increments to see if it helps. You may also have to tweak the memory controller voltage as well. In addition to turning XMP on, you should also consider adjusting your memory sub-timings. You can watch someone like Buildzoid on actually hardcore overclocking to learn how to do this manually, but most motherboards now come with automatic memory tweaking options that usually do a decent job. In addition, a sub-timing tweak that helps boost performance and reduce system latency is to increase the T-Refi to 65535. This will work on most CPUs and is a common tweak used by pros to help extract max performance from a system. After you are done tuning Tuning your RAM, I would again highly recommend running a memory testing tool like Kahu to make sure that your memory is indeed stable. In addition to installing high-speed RAM, you should also consider overclocking your CPU cores. Overclocking your CPU is highly silicon dependent, so the fastest way to determine a good overclock is to use the Intel Extreme Tuning Utility, or XTU. I like this tool because you can rapidly make changes directly in Windows, thereby avoiding having to reboot into BIOS every time you make a change. When you go to the Intel XTU download page, make sure you download version 10.x or later, which supports the new Intel Core Ultra processors. Intel, for some unknown reason, decided to list it second on the download page to make things just a little more confusing. When you first load XTU, you will be presented with the basic view. I would recommend starting with your efficient cores for Arrow Lake CPUs. Based on my testing, I've found that increasing the E-Core frequency will give you a relatively large increase in performance. You can use the built-in benchmark to baseline your system. However, I've found it to give somewhat inconsistent results with each run. So if you do plan to use it, I recommend running it three times and taking an average. You can then increase the ratio by 1x and rerun the benchmark. You are looking for best performance, not the highest ratio that will run stable. So when you notice that the scores start dropping, then you should go back to the previous ratio, which should be your optimum. For your performance core or P-core ratio, I recommend switching to the advanced view. The reason I recommend doing this is that the ratios are different depending on how many P-cores are active. I recommend tuning the 3 to 8 active core ratio first before tuning the 1 to 2 active core ratio. Again, this is highly silicon dependent and you're looking for max performance and not max frequencies. They will very likely not be the same. Once you find an optimum, I recommend running a more comprehensive tool like Cinebench or Ada64 to see if your system is stable and how much your performance actually increased. I can't emphasize enough that these tweaks are highly dependent on silicon quality, so it can take some time to tune your system properly. After you find your optimum ratios in XTU, I recommend resetting the tool to default values and entering the new ratios directly in BIOS. For the MSI Meg Z890 Unify X motherboard that I'm using in this video, you can input your E-Core ratio on the over clocking page under E-Core Ratio. For my 285K, I found 49X to be optimum. For the P-Cores, you can select Turbo Ratio next to P-Core Ratio Apply Mode so that you can adjust each core. 
For each of the eight performance cores, you can enter in the ratios from XDU next to Target P-Core Turbo Ratio Group X, where X is the core number. For my 285K, I left the first two active cores at 57X, but I increased the third to eighth active cores to 55X. As you can see, these are not large frequency overclocks, and my 285K was stable at higher frequencies, but these tweaks provided me with my largest increase in performance, which is what matters most. After you're done tuning your CPU cores, you can go back into XDU, click on Advanced View, and then click on Cache at the top. You can then adjust your processor cache ratio, often called your ring ratio. Once you find an optimum with the built-in benchmark tool, I recommend running a tool like Cinebench or Ada64 to make sure that your system really is stable. After you find your optimum in XDU, I recommend resetting the cache to the default value and making this change directly in BIOS. For the MSI Meg Z890 Unify X motherboard, you can input your processor cache ratio on the overclocking page under ring ratio. For my 285K, I found that 40X provided the best performance. You should also overclock your NGU or next generation uncore fabric and D2D or die to die interface. You can adjust your NGU ratio in XDU by clicking on the other tab and adjusting the SA fabric ratio. However, I would recommend simply adjusting them both directly in BIOS. The NGU default ratio is 26X, while the D2D default is 21X, but I found that you can push them both much higher without impacting system stability. For the MSI Meg Z890 Unify X motherboard, you can input your NGU and D2D on the overclocking page under NGU ratio and CPU D2D ratio. For my 285K, I found that 34X for the NGU and 36X for the D2D provided the best performance. The final tweaks that you should consider making to extract max performance from your Intel Arrow Lake CPU are to change your power profile in BIOS change your power plan in Windows, and turn memory integrity off. For the MSI Meg Z890 Unify X motherboard, you can click on the overclocking option under MSI Performance Preset and select MSI Extreme Settings. This effectively changes the PL2 from 250 watts to 295 watts and ICC Max from 347 amps to 400 amps while leaving PL1 at 250 watts. This additional boost in power and current help improve system stability at higher frequencies. However, the CPU temps will increase, so keep that in mind if you don't have a good cooling solution. To change your power plan in Windows, open up control panel, click on hardware and sound, and then click on power options. You should select the high performance option to ensure that your CPU cores don't go to sleep while gaming. In addition, you should also consider turning off memory integrity. You can do this by going to Windows Security and selecting Device Security. Under Core Isolation, click on Core Isolation Details and make sure that memory integrity is turned off. At this point, you may be asking, what about Intel APO and undervolting your CPU? Let's start with Intel Application Optimization or APO, which is a Windows app that optimizes thread scheduling for selected game titles. As mentioned earlier, Earlier in the video, Intel acknowledged that the APO was not functioning correctly with Core Ultra 200S processors, but that the issue has since been fixed in later versions of Windows. So I decided to try it with Total War Warhammer 3, which is a supported game, but as you can see from the results, it does still not appear to be working properly. Given this data, combined with my prior experience testing APO extensively with my 265K, I decided to not conduct any further testing. It's simply not a tool I can recommend using at this time. With respect to undervolting, I tried using the Core Voltage Offset option in XDU. It requires you to first disable Hypervisor in Windows and undervolt protection in BIOS, but unfortunately I found that it had a significant negative impact on system stability. I started to experience issues on my Gigabyte Z890 Aorus Master motherboard after conducting extensive undervolt testing, which is the primary reason why I ended up switching to the MSI Meg Z890 Unify X. So it's not something I would recommend doing for Core Ultra 200S processors. So in summary, the tweaks that I recommend making to extract max performance from your Intel Core Ultra 9 285K are 1. Install high-speed RAM, turn XMP on and adjust memory sub-timings. 2. Overclock performance and efficient cores. 3. Overclock ring ratio, NGU fabric and D2D interface. And four, set power profile in BIOS, set power plan in Windows, and turn memory integrity off. The impact of these tweaks on performance is summarized in this table. I used Cinebench R24 multi-core as the benchmark, and I turned on each tweak individually so I could show its impact on performance, starting with the smallest and ending in the largest. When implemented together, the boost in performance is around 8%, which is significant. As you can see in the table, one of the largest increases in performance came from overclocking the E-cores, which isn't surprising given the increased importance of E-cores now that hyper-threading has been removed. 
It's also important to point out that many of these tweaks are synergistic, so although they don't appear to have an impact on performance when implemented individually, they do help lower latency, improve performance, and low attempts when implemented together. One important point to re-emphasize is that the performance boost that you're able to achieve will be heavily dependent upon silicon quality. There is no guarantee that your CPU will be stable with all of these tweaks enabled. As I stated earlier, I would highly recommend running a CPU intensive test like Cinebench or Ada64 and running a memory stability tool like Kahu to make sure that your system is actually stable. If at any point you find that your CPU is not stable, then back off on that tweak and retest. Remember, it's not rocket science, it's Lego. My goal is to help you make the right component choices and put them together the right way every single time. Thank you for watching this video in the It's Not Rocket Science How To series. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit the like button and subscribe so you don't miss out on future episodes. And if you would like to support the channel further and gain access to some really great perks, please also consider joining our new membership program. Bye for now.